Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present part nine of my series on the selective gross pathology of the respiratory system. We're going to talk about helmets. Helmets include three phyla, the nematodes, the cestodes, and the trematodes, and we'll see at least one example of each in this lecture. Before we start, as I always do, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who have provided me these great images, which allow me to put these lectures together and share them with you. I don't have any parasites from the nose of domestic species. There aren't that many. There are a couple like Eucoleus boemi or Anatrica cinnamolgi, uh, both nematodes that burrow within the nasal mucosa of dogs and non-human primates uh, specifically, but they don't generally leave very good lesions. The first macroscopic parasite that I have to show you is one whose name I never get correct. Um, this red spirurid is Mama monogamous laryngeus. Mama monogamous laryngeus. There are people that can say that, and I'm not one of them. Um, and it's characteristically found, as the name says, in the larynx of uh, ox and other wild bovids. Um, this particular parasite doesn't cause a whole lot of problems. You see roughening of the mucosa. The animal may cough. Um, but it's not a significant issue. And there are other species of mammal monogamous which live in humans as well as uh, non-bovid species. The redness that uh, characterizes this particular nematode is because it is a spirurid parasite, like Spirocerca lupi, another much larger red parasite, and that's because it has some brightly eosinophilic material within the pseudocelome, which gives it a red color. I'm going to show you our next parasite is also red, but for a totally different reason. Try one more time. Mammal monogamous laryngeus. Third time's the charm. Okay, here we're looking at a quail or a pheasant who obviously is not doing very well. Uh, his eyes are closed and he is open mouth breathing. He's down on the ground because he can't get much air. This is a, uh, a very characteristic clinical sign for a nematode parasite of the trachea called Syngamous tracheae. You can see this nematode in the trachea of chickens, turkeys, pheasants, guinea fowl, and quail, and it has a worldwide distribution. If we take a look at the nematode, first thing you will notice is that it is red. And the reason this one's red is not because of anything that it has within its body cavity, but because it is hematophagous, which means it sucks blood. And there are a number of parasites that you'll see in the animal kingdom um, that are blood-sucking parasites and are red. And this is a big red worm. The, the second thing that you will notice is that uh, all of the male and the female worms are mixed in the uh, trachea lumen. The females are much larger than the smaller males. And the males actually are inserted in the turtle coitus um, within the females. So they look like little Ys. You have a uh, a female, and then you have the male sort of projecting off of it. Um, very characteristic for Syngamous tracheae. And then uh, if blocking the airway wasn't enough and sucking the animal's blood wasn't enough, um, over time they will develop granulomatous inflammation at the points in which they insert into the tracheal wall. So it's a very significant parasite. Its life cycle can be either direct so the parasite uh, lives in the trachea, the female lays eggs, they're coughed up and swallowed, passed out in the feces, and if another susceptible bird comes and uh, gets into that and swallows it, then they can become infected, or they can also use earthworms uh, as uh, a intermediate host. And just to show you the, uh, the range of birds that can see this. This is a picture from uh, uh, Pompey Bolfa, Ross University, um, showing the presence of these Y-shaped red worms within the trachea of an ostrich. 
whereas the respiratory problems caused by these worms are probably the most important. Uh, you can also see anemia from the presence of enough of these blood-sucking strongyl nematodes. Let's move a little further down the, uh, the trachea, and as we get down to what's known as the carina, or the bifurcation of the trachea at the bottom where the major bronchi come off, you can see these granulomas uh, caused by oscillaris oscillari, which is seen in canids, predominantly wild canids, and very characteristically uh, occurs in this location. What we're looking at here are granulomas that are formed underneath the mucosa by the presence of large numbers of fifth stage larvae. And that's what we're looking at here. You can see all of the larvae there. Now over time, um, the females will produce eggs. They can be passed to the young pups in a number of ways, either through grooming or through regurgitative feeding or through eating the mother's feces. They're, they have a direct life cycle. Um, there is no intermediate host that is required, and the first stage larvae are immediately infective uh, to the young pups. Over time, as the parasites die and the body mounts a middling immune response to this, these granulomas will become calcified and filled with the dead worms. And you can imagine, if you have this many calcified granulomas at the entrance of the major airways, it may cause dyspnea, but the vast majority of these cases are totally asymptomatic. As long as the worms are alive, there's a minimal reaction to it. Once they start to die, then uh, you have granuloma formation and calcification. Okay, here's a condition that we're all very familiar with in the dog, and that is heartworm disease. And, and I cover heartworm disease primarily within the uh, the cardiovascular system where we look at the changes that we see in the pulmonary artery known as villar arteritis and the changes that we see in the large vessels of affected animals primarily in the caudal dorsal lobe the remodeling as a result of a combination of uh, chronic hypoxia as well as uh, in some animals the embolization of dead worms um, what I do want you to see, though, in the lung, and I think that this is a very characteristic picture, is um, because of the changes in hemodynamics uh, between the right ventricular uh, hyperplasia and failure uh, between the uh, uh, long-term hypoxia and smooth muscle changes. You have some significant changes here in the lung you often will see hemosiderin and it gives the lungs sort of a brownish, muddy brownish discoloration. They often are hyperinflated in some areas and you can see some, some ribs here. When I see this sort of patchy brown discoloration of the lung, heartworms, whether it's diaphylaria imminis or it is angiostrongula mesorum, the uh, European form of heartworm, um, comes to the top of my list. And then I also think about canine distemper. Uh, in one of the early lectures, uh, lecture number three, we talked about canine distemper, sort of the patchy distribution. One thing that we don't see here that we often see with canine distemper is there is no anterior ventral bronchopneumonia, but just a, something that, uh, you know, over time you may uh, just be, become uh, uh, a gestalt is this sort of patchy brownish discoloration that's often seen with uh, uh, animals infected with heartworm disease. Okay, so we are moving into nematodes that actually live inside the lung parenchyma. And it's sort of difficult to, uh, um, to point at any one and, and definitively identify, but I do want to cover a number of them. Um, here is one that you can see in the dogs. This is known as Phileroides herthi. We're back in the lung. The adults live in the alveoli and the respiratory bronchioles. Um, and this, once again, like many lungworms, has a direct life cycle with the eggs being coughed up and passed into the dam's feces. It doesn't show that well here, but 
these nodules often have sort of a greenish cast to them because when you have the presence of, of nematodes outside of the airways as they're burrowing through the tissue, um, they will often attract a large number of eosinophils. And eosinophils, when you get enough of them together, have an odd greenish cast to it. Eosinophil conformation of the muscles is characteristic patches of green. So whenever I see green in the lungs of these little areas of hemorrhage, and I'll show you a couple more as we go through this lecture, I always think about parasite migration. Um, there is another related parasite that will live in the lungs of uh, of the dog that is uh, used to be called Filaroides milksi, but it's been changed now like everything gets changed to Anderson strongulus milksi. But uh, to tell the difference, you need an intact worm. You have to dissect that out, and that's not something I really have the patience for. Um, the other thing that I would think about would be uh, ascarine migration. Um, because remember that uh, Toxicara, uh, when it, it goes through the body, it will, it will, you know, before it gets back to the, to the intestine as an adult, uh, the egg will hatch in the intestine, the, the larva will move out into the body and they will go through the lungs, the liver, uh, the kidney and a number of organs. And you may see sort of a yellowish uh, discoloration and small areas of hemorrhage. The animal doesn't show much signs. It may have a soft cough, but the migration usually doesn't cause much of a problem unless it gets into some very sensitive areas like the back of the eye. Here's another case of ascarine migration. These are lungs from a pig. Remember, you can always tell because they have this really long uh, caudal lobe. Um, always reminds me a little of a, a sea turtle because you've got these long caudal lobes and you have these uh, the middle lobes here which look a little like flippers. But uh, I digress. The uh, okay, so we're seeing the exact same picture here, and this is uh, this is eosinophilic pneumonia due to ascarid migration, ascarid suum in pigs. Okay, same thing. A little bit of hemorrhage as it moves through, and it has in some areas sort of a greenish cast to it. The animal. The pig won't have that many problems with this unless it's a really severe infection. Usually it just coughs a bit. Um, it's one of the causes of thumps. Uh, some people call them summer colds uh, or summer sickness, but it's just the migration of the immature parasites through the lung fields. Here's a classic picture I've used for years and years, and this is the lung of a cat. It's probably a feral cat lives outdoors and you have to get a little bit oriented on this and when we look at this bright pink almost whitish part of a lung this is the good part this is the part that is transferring air it's patent this area down here and this darker salmon colored and these little areas scattered through the lung are areas of atelectasis and granulomatous inflammation because this animal is affected with a lungworm known as Allurostrongulus obstrusus. Allurostrongulus obstrusus um, utilizes a snail or a slug as an intermediate host and in the vast majority of cases uh, that you see in uh, feral cats it doesn't really cause much of a problem but it can be associated with other diseases uh, such as immunosuppression from feline leukemia uh, or FIV and secondary bacterial infection. So when you put enough of these diseases in the lung, eventually you're going to get a life-threatening case, but you can find it as an incidental finding in uh, feral cats who tolerate it with very little problem. But just remember this light part's the aerated and this part here is atelectatic. So this animal might have had something else going on, maybe even FIP on top of this. And when you throw something on top of a lower strongulus obstrusus, you can run into problems. Okay, what species are we looking at? Absolutely, we're looking at a pig. It's that really long caudal lobe. And you can see that this particular uh, lung has areas of some hyperinflation, maybe a little atelectasis, but I wanna 
uh, show you these greenish uh, wedge-shaped areas of hyperinflation in the back. This is characteristic of certain species of lungworms in pig. The green is from the eosinophils that you see. This is a case of metastrongulus apri, although it's very difficult, uh, if not impossible, to speciate just based on uh, external look at the lungs. There are a number of lungworms in pigs, including uh, metastrongulus uh, apri, salmi, and pudendotectus. And for those of you who are taking certification examinations, um, I approach this by learning one. Okay, and so I remembered apri. There are, when there are multiple types of, of coccidia, or multiple types of nematodes or whatever that affect the species, and they're difficult to tell the difference, as long as you know one. Uh, it'd be very unusual on an examination for someone to say, oh, give me three types of lungworms in a pig. As long as you know one, you're in pretty good shape. So I wouldn't look at these long lists that you can get out of the textbooks and say, I'll never remember that. Get one nail it down and you'll do fine. So, but these are great. And this is very characteristic of this particular uh, parasite. A lot of the uh, metastrongyle nematodes um, in the lungs, and that's probably the most common species uh, that, that we see or family across, uh, across the, all of the, the species of veterinary importance. But a lot of the metastrongyles, you will see the adults that are in the, uh, uh, the airways and you may see the eggs and, and larva within the alveoli and it's very common for them to pop up and the lesions are most severe in the caudodorsal lungs where the airways are wider and longer um, and these sort of eosinophilic greenish uh, areas of uh, inflammation and collapse are very characteristic for a number of these metastrongyle parasites. And I'll show them to you again in a minute. And as we open uh, this up, we are at the back end of the lung and you can see the presence of the adult nematodes within the large airways. A lot of times you'll find the eggs and the, and the, uh, uh, the larval forms out here, but uh, the adults like to hang out in the large airways. In small ruminants, there are two very important uh, metastrongyles, Mullarius capillaris and Protostrongylus rufescens. And once again, we see the initial lesions over the large airways of the caudal dorsal lung. Now, as the infection gets worse, it tends to travel and you'll see them all over the uh, lungs of this animal. So here's another picture uh, of a sheep with the large granulomas over the large airways. Um, so this is Mullarius capillaris or Protostrongylus rufescens. Uh, Dr. King used to say that uh, if you saw the nodules all over, it's probably Mullarius, and if it's just here, it's Protostrongylus. That has not been my experience, so I will just give you one or the other, and then we will allow um, Dr. Gardner to sort it out for us. For those of you who are not familiar with Dr. Chris Gardner, he published uh, an excellent book on the identification of nematode parasites and tissue section. It's available through the Davis Thompson Foundation. It is the best investment you'll ever make in a book. And if you see a lot of nematodes and you want to be able to key them out based on morphologic uh, appearance in tissue section, I uh, recommend his book very highly. I recommend sending a slide to him uh, even more, but uh, his book is the next best thing. So we have these parasites which are present, they're greenish, discolored all over, and then as time goes by, it's going to spread out from there, and then you'll get a lung who has nodules throughout. Once again, a great picture from Helen Ackland of the University of Pennsylvania of uh, Mullarius infection in a sheep. And can you see a little bit of a greenish discoloration to these nodules as well. I hope you can, especially here. And that's all those eosinophils in there. Okay, um, 
there are a number of other uh, metastrongyl uh, parasites that live, or trichostrongyl parasites that live within the airways and the caudal part of the lung primarily. In, and it's, you should know the names of these. The life cycle is not all that different. They usually don't cause too much of a problem unless they're complicated with secondary bacterial pneumonia. These very small trichostrongyls in the airways of a uh, sheep are Dictyocallus filaria. Um, they usually live in the caudal airways, and you can see there's that wedge-shaped area of discoloration that's so common with the uh, infection in the caudal airways by lungworms. There are a number of Dictyocallus species that are should be of note in cattle. Dictyocallus, this small trichostrongyl. Uh, sorry, this is a horse. Um, and this is Dictyocallus arnfeldi. Now, you're going to say, well, what's this doing in the trachea? I thought they lived in the caudal airway. And yes, these just got washed up by some froth. But we've talked in previous lectures how uh, equids, especially sometimes at, at necropsy, they will produce a lot of foam, especially if uh, the death is somewhat agonal. And these just got washed up. But they're a nice picture, but you really have to pretend that they're way back uh, in the caudal airways. Um, Dictyocallus uh, arnfeldi is really more of a problem for donkeys. It's a donkey parasite that spills over into horses. Um, most of the time, these parasites, uh, when the eggs are uh, uh, are swallowed and, and they get into the airways, they don't complete their life cycle. They don't get to the adult stage, and only if a uh, horse or donkey is infected as a foal, do they really get to the completion of the life cycle where they pass eggs uh, back up, cough them up, and swallow them. So uh, once again, look for those wedge-shaped areas of overinflation and inflammation in the caudal dorsal lungs in horses as well, and you will see them. And in cattle, you will see uh, these trichostrongyl parasites in the same exact spots, and the name for that is Dictyocallus viviparis. Okay, uh, please, when you spell viviparis, it's spelled a little oddly. It's V I V I P A R U S. There's no O in it. And I know a pathologist uh, makes him very upset when you do that. So, uh, Dictyocallus viviparis. So we talked about Dictyocallus viviparis in cattle, Dictyocallus. Call us Arnfeldi in donkeys and horses, Dictyocallus uh, filaria in sheep. And deer have them too, and I could probably go through a lot of different species. Theirs is Dictyocallus viviparis, so they can be cross infected from cattle, or Dictyocallus eckerti. These are the deer lungworms. Uh, some other sort of less common uh, uh, parasites. This is a, uh, if you look, there's a lot of exudate within the airways of these, the lung from this fox. This is an infection with capillary, capillaria uh, uh, aerophila. Now eucolius aerophila has uh, a bit of, been a problem in wild canids and some felids for quite a while. Well, capillary, as a general rule, will parasitize the uh, very upper layers of the mucosa. And in certain areas of the country, there's an extremely high 75% uh, uh, infection rate in foxes. And every year, a number of the young pups succumb to severe infections uh, with eucolius. There's another one called Crenosoma vulpis, um, which you can see in foxes as well. So capillary, when I think of capillary, I normally think of uh, uh, the uh, GI parasitism, which we see in the upper GI tract of birds, and uh, uh, capillary eggs, which you can see in wild rats in the liver. Um, capillary hepatica, very interesting parasite because um, to continue the life cycle, the animal which carries the eggs in its liver has to die and be eaten by something else for the life cycle continued. Probably not the best evolutionary move on the uh, uh, on the part of capillary hepatica. 
and here is Cranosoma vulpis, okay, uh, living very happily in the airways of a red fox. As we wind down on the nematodes, and there aren't too many uh, significant trematodes or, or cystodes, but we want to talk about one or two of them. Um, we're getting into the more exotic species. These are uh, strongyle lungworms of seals. The, the name of this particular parasite is Odostrongylus circumlitis, and it's seen in a variety of seals, probably uh, harbor seals uh, are the natural host. Uh, but it spills over and it can cause significant problems in ring seals and northern uh, uh, elephant seals. Um, from time to time, it will cause significant morbidity and more stranding and mortality in especially younger pups. Um, in some years on the West Coast, it may go up to 40% uh, of stranding deaths in young animals are the result of severe lungworm infections. And if you do any type of uh, marine mammals, you will see these on a very regular basis. Then one more, one more just for fun, a uh, lungworm. I'm sure there are a lot of other species of this, but we are looking at the lung of a snake and the lung of a frog. And these black worms, which are somewhat embedded in the mucosa here, and adherent to the uh, uh, lining of the lung in this frog are Rhabdius species. Rhabdius species is an interesting uh, lungworm that you see in snakes and you see in uh, frogs and toads. And uh, it's interesting because it has the ability to live both a parasitic life cycle followed by a free living life cycle. Most of the parasites that we've talked about today are obligate parasites and they don't really survive, but a Rhabdius has the ability to become a free living nematode uh, if it so wants. Well, I don't know if they are self-determining, but if the conditions are not correct for it to find another host, it can live as a nematode in the wild, usually in bodies of water. Okay, as we leave the nematodes, and there's so many nematodes that I didn't even touch on, but I think we caught some of the big ones, the names that you absolutely should know, some of the gross lesions that are associated with them. Let's look at a trematode parasite that is well known for its ability to make a home in the lung, especially in mammals, uh, commonly in felids, and this is Paragonimus. There are two forms in the U.S. It's Paragonimus kelicati in, uh, in Asia. You have Paragonimus westermanii. Um, this one has an intermediate host, which is usually a fish or a crayfish. And then the animal who eats that will ingest the, uh, uh, the trematode eggs. This is a very interesting uh, parasite because it forms large cysts. Uh, predominantly in the caudal uh, dorsal lobes or the caudal lobes of the lung. You can see a little bit of hemorrhage around here. And you will always find them in pairs. Okay, you always find two in there. Um, when the metacercaria initially penetrate the lungs, you'll see uh, hemorrhage, you'll see those sort of eosinophilic nodules, and over time you will have a it, only a few of them will survive to become adults, and you can have one or multiple cysts within the lung. Um, the, the top part of this has been opened so you can see the flukes. Sometimes you will have just a very thin pleural membrane over that if they make home close to the surface. Um, they can, a lot of times the, uh, the infections are asymptomatic, but every once in a while you can get one in which the cyst ruptures resulting in pneumothorax and, uh, and a real problem for the cat. So this is Paragonimus kelicanti. Remember that uh, intermediate host. Cestodes, well, there's one that we really need to talk about because it will commonly get into the lung and this is a Kinococcus granulosus. Kinococcus granulosus is a cestode or a tapeworm of dogs. Um, and so the, the definitive host is the dog. 
it will develop an intestinal infection and it will lay the eggs. If someone gets into the eggs, they will um, penetrate the intestine, they will circulate, and they will get out into the portal circulation. The two biggest spots in the body in which these large hydatid cysts develop are the liver number one and then the lung. You can find them anywhere. You can find them in the brain or the eye or whatever. That's fairly unusual um, because the liver is so close and receives most of the portal circulation when the hexacanth embryo gets breaks through the wall uh, and gets into one of those vessels. It goes off sailing and most of them are filtered out in the liver. So that's where you see. But you can see hydatid cysts. If they make it through the liver, they'll shoot through the heart and then they'll end up getting stuck in one of the pulmonary capillaries. And hydatid cysts are very thick walled cysts. You can see one, you can see multiple. Look at all of these in there. They're very thick walled cysts. Here's a fixed specimen of a lung. And you can see that the, the wall is uh, probably uh, several millimeters thick. They're extremely hardy. I like to say that uh, if a, uh, a camel dies in the middle of Sahara Desert and sits in the hot sun for 10 days, and you get there to necropsy, you might not be able to identify much of anything, but that hydatid cyst, which is in the liver or the lung, is gonna look absolutely perfect. Okay, and the cool part about these cysts, let me show you another one from an elk. Okay, we're in the liver, but it has this very thick fibrous capsule. Um, and then if you look on the inside, you'll see all of these little round, uh, and you see them back here too. Um, these are known as protoscolases. Um, they are the developing form of the tapeworm. And when, a, when this animal dies and a dog comes along and eats this liver, it has to eat the liver. These aren't passed out in the feces. Um, when it eats the liver, then each one of these is going to turn into a single tapeworm in the dogs. And these tapeworms aren't really big, actually. Um, so each one, so this dog is, is bound, that eats this, is bound to get a really good case of echinococcus. There's, there are two large, uh, well, two important uh, species in echinococcus. One is granulosis, which causes the single hydatid cyst. Another one is echinococcus multilocularis, um, where the cysts don't have these thick walls and they continually bud. And they look sort of like soap bubbles and they can fill up an animal's abdomen or replace large parts of its liver. But we're not gonna talk about that one here. I really wanna focus on these hydatid cysts. Now, uh, normally you have a dog or before dog cycle, but uh, pretty much any species can pick up this, or at least any mammalian species. So it's not uncommon in rodents as well. And people can get this too if they, uh, for some reason, get into an area which has been contaminated with uh, these uh, protoscolases. Uh, people can get hydatid cysts as well. So mostly nematodes in this lecture, uh, one big trematode, one big cestode, and we have completed a cursory look at the uh, uh, the helminth infections of note in animal species. Uh, once again, remember that book by Chris Gardner on uh, uh, nematodes and tissue section, because I think it will be very helpful. Not all of us have the ability every time we see uh, a nematode or trematode or cestode to send it off for PCR. Um, and for many, many years, we were able to very well identify these downed species based on the morphology. It's, it's great. It's like a detective game. And then because Chris is a personal friend, I have the ability on the tough ones. And he tells me that uh, every nematode is tough for me, but I have the ability to send, uh, send uh, a slide. And he usually is, can always tell me what it is. So if you ever want to get a hold of Chris Gardner, he is still working. And uh, if you contact me, I'm happy to put you in touch with him because he just loves to look at uh, uh, parasites in tissue section. Okay, with that, that's the end of this lecture. A little over a half hour, not too bad. Uh, thank you so much for spending time with me. Um, happy 4th of July to everybody here in the United States. And I hope that you're enjoying your weekend. You're going to be safe. Uh, you're going to wear that mask. And we will see you for our next lecture on arthropod diseases of the respiratory tract.
take care everybody